Serfdom from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. Serfdom was the status of many peasants under feudalism, specifically relating to manorialism and similar systems. It was a condition of debt bondage and indentured servitude with similarities to indifferences from slavery which developed during the late antiquity and early Middle Ages in Europe and lasted in some countries until the mid-19th century. 1. Unlike slaves, serfs could not be bought, sold, or traded individually though they could, depending on the area, be sold together with land. The co-ops in Russia, by contrast, could be traded like regular slaves, could be abused with no rights over their own bodies, could not leave the land they were bound to and could marry only with their lord's permission, citation needed, serfs who occupied a plot of land were required to work for the lord of the manor who owned that land. In return, they were entitled to protection, justice, and the right to cultivate certain fields within the manor to maintain their own subsistence. Serfs were often required not only to work on the lord's fields but also in his mines and forests and to labor to maintain roads. The manor formed the basic unit of feudal society, and the lord of the manor and the villains, and to a certain extent the serfs were bound legally by taxation in the case of the former, and economically and socially in the latter. The decline of serfdom in Western Europe has sometimes been attributed to the widespread plague epidemic of the Black Death which reached Europe in 1347 and caused massive fatalities. Disrupting society, too, the decline had begun before that date. Serfdom became increasingly rare in most of Western Europe after the medieval renaissance at the outset of the High Middle Ages. But, conversely, it grew stronger in Central and Eastern Europe, where it had previously been less common, this phenomenon was known as later serfdom. In Eastern Europe, the institution persisted until the mid-19th century. In the Austrian Empire, serfdom was abolished by the 1781 serfdom bat and corvée continued to exist until 1848. Serfdom was abolished in Russia in 1861-3. Russia declared serfdom unacceptable in its general state laws for the Prussian states in 1792 and finally abolished it in October 1807. In the wake of the Prussian reform movement for, in Finland, Norway, and Sweden, feudalism was never fully established and serfdom did not exist in Denmark. Serfdom-like institutions did exist in both Stavins, the Stavinsbund, from 1733 to 1788, and its vassal Iceland, the more restrictive Vistarband, from 1490 until 1894. According to medievalist historian Joseph R. Strayer, the concept of feudalism can also be applied to the societies of ancient Persia, ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, 6th to 12th dynasty, Islamic ruled northern and central India, China, Zhou dynasty and end of Han dynasty, and Japan during the Soganate. Wu Takayan argued that the Shangzhou Fengjin were kinship estates. Quite distinct from feudalism, 5 James Lee and Cameron Campbell describe the Chinese Qing Dynasty 1644 to 1912 as also maintaining a form of serfdom. 6. Melvin Goldstein described Tibet as having had serfdom until 1959, 7, 8 but whether or not the Tibetan form of peasant tenancy that qualified as serfdom was widespread is contested by other scholars. 9, 10, Bhutan is described by Tashi Wangchuk a Bhutanese civil servant, as having officially abolished serfdom by 1959, but he believes that less than or about 10% of poor peasants were in copyhold situations. 11. The United Nations 1956 Supplementary Convention on the Abolition of Slavery also prohibits serfdom as a practice similar to slavery. 12. History Main Article, History of Serfdom. Galician slaughter in 1846 was a revolt against serfdom, directed against manorial property and oppression. Social institutions similar to serfdom were known in ancient times. The status of the helots in the ancient Greek city-state of Sparta resembled that of the medieval serfs. By the 3rd century AD, the Roman Empire faced a labor shortage. Large Roman landowners increasingly relied on Roman freemen, acting as tenant farmers instead of slaves to provide labor. 13. These tenant farmers, eventually known as colonies, saw their conditions steadily erode. 
because the tax system implemented by Diocletian assessed taxes based on both land and the inhabitants of that land. It became administratively inconvenient for peasants to leave the land where they were counted in the census. 13. Medieval serfdom really began with the breakup of the Carolingian Empire around the 10th century, citation needed during this period. Powerful feudal lords encouraged the establishment of serfdom as a source of agricultural labor. Serfdom, indeed, was an institution that reflected a fairly common practice whereby great landlords were assured that others worked to feed them and were held down, legally and economically, while doing so. This arrangement provided most of the agricultural labor throughout the Middle Ages. Slavery persisted right through the Middle Ages 14, but it was rare. In the later Middle Ages serfdom began to disappear west of the Rhine even as it spread through Eastern Europe. Serfdom reached Eastern Europe centuries later than Western Europe, it became dominant around the 15th century. In many of these countries serfdom was abolished during the Napoleonic invasions of the early 19th century, though in some it persisted until mid or late 19th century. Russia main article, Serfdom in Russia. Serfdom became the dominant form of relation between Russian peasants and nobility in the 17th century. Serfdom only existed in central and southern areas of the Russian Empire. It was never established in the north, in the Urals, and in Siberia. According to the Encyclopedia of Human Rights, in 1649 up to three-quarters of Muscovy's peasants, or 13 to 14 million people, were serfs whose material lives were barely distinguishable from slaves. Perhaps another 1.5 million were formerly enslaved, with Russian slaves serving Russian masters. 15. Russia's over 23 million, about 38% of the total population, 16, privately held serfs were freed from their lords by an edict of Alexander II in 1861. The owners were compensated through taxes on the freed serfs. State serfs were emancipated in 1866, 17. Etymology. Costumes of slaves or serfs from the 6th to the 12th centuries. Collected by H. Neville Castle from original documents in European libraries the word serf originated from the Middle French serf and was derived from the Latin service slave. In late antiquity in most of the Middle Ages what are now called serfs were usually designated in Latin as colony. As slavery gradually disappeared and the legal status of servi became nearly identical to that of the colony, the term changed meaning into the modern concept of serf. The word serf is first recorded in English in the late 15th century and came to its current definition in the 17th century. Serfdom was coined in 1850, citation needed. Dependency in the lower order serfs had a specific place in feudal society, as did barons and knights, in return for protection. A serf would reside upon and work a parcel of land within the manor of his lord. Thus, the manorial system exhibited a degree of reciprocity. One rationale held that serfs and freemen worked for all, while a knight or baron bought for all, and a churchman prayed for all, thus everyone had a place. The serf was the worst fed and rewarded however, although unlike slaves had certain rights in land and property. A lord of the manor could not sell his serfs as a Roman might sell his slaves. On the other hand, if he chose to dispose of a parcel of land, the serfs associated with that land stayed with it to serve their new lord, simply speaking. They were implicitly sold in mass and as a part of a lot. This unified system preserved for the lord long acquired knowledge of practices suited to the land. Further, a serf could not abandon his lands without permission, 18, nor did he possess a saleable title in them, 19. Initiation a freeman became a serf usually through force or necessity. Sometimes the greater physical and legal force of a local magnate intimidated freeholders or all odial owners into dependency. Often a few years of crop failure, a war, or brigandage might leave a person unable to make his own way. In such a case, he could strike a bargain with a lord of a manor. In exchange for gaining protection, his service was required, in labor, produce, or cash, or a combination of all. These bargains became formalized in a ceremony known as bondage, in which a serf placed his head in the lord's hands. 
Akin to the ceremony of homage where a vassal placed his hands between those of his overlord. These oaths bound a lord and his new serf in a feudal contract and defined the terms of their agreement. 20. Often these bargains were severe. A 7th century Anglo-Saxon oath of fealty states. By the Lord before whom this sanctuary is holy, I will to and be true and faithful, and love all which he loves and shun all which he shuns. According to the laws of God in the order of the world. Nor will I ever with will or action, through word or deed, do anything which is unpleasing to him, on condition that he will hold to me as I shall deserve it. And that he will perform everything as it was in our agreement when I submitted myself to him and chose his will. To become a serf was a commitment that encompassed all aspects of the serf's life. The children born to serfs inherited their status, and we're considered born into serfdom. By taking on the duties of serfdom, people bound themselves in their progeny. Class system The social class of the peasantry can be differentiated into smaller categories. These distinctions were often less clear than suggested by their different names. Most often, there were two types of peasants. Freemen, workers whose tenure within the manor was freehold villain lower classes of peasants known as cotters or bordars generally comprising the younger sons of villains 21, 22, vagabonds, and slaves. Made up the lower class of workers. Colony The colonist system used in the late Roman Empire can be considered the predecessor of Western European feudal serfdom 23, 24. Freeman Freeman. Our free tenants held their land by one of a variety of contracts of feudal land tenure. And were essentially rent-paying tenant farmers who owed little or no service to the Lord. And had a good degree of security of tenure and independence. In parts of 11th century England freemen made up only 10% of the peasant population and in most of the rest of Europe their numbers were also small. Ministerials Ministerials were hereditary and free knights tied to their lord that formed the lowest rung of nobility in the Holy Roman Empire. Villain See also Villain A villain or villain represented the most common type of serf in the Middle Ages. Dubious discuss villains had more rights and higher status than the lowest serf, but existed under a number of legal restrictions that differentiated them from freemen. Villains generally rented small homes with a patch of land. As part of the contract with the landlord, the lord of the manor, they were expected to spend some of their time working on the lord's fields. The requirement often was not greatly onerous contrary to popular belief and was often only seasonal. For example the duty to help at harvest time, citation needed, the rest of their time was spent farming their own land for their own profit. Villains were tied to their lord's land and couldn't leave it without his permission. Their lord also often decided whom they could marry at 25. Like other types of serfs, villains had to provide other services possibly in addition to paying rent of money or produce. Villains were somehow retained on their land and by unmentioned manners could not move away without their lord's consent in the acceptance of the lord to whose manner they proposed to migrate to. Villains were generally able to hold their own property, unlike slaves. Villainage, as opposed to other forms of serfdom, was most common in continental European feudalism, where land ownership had developed from roots in Roman law. A variety of kinds of villainage existed in Europe in the Middle Ages. Half-villains received only half as many strips of land for their own use and owed a full complement of labor to the Lord often forcing them to rent out their services to other serfs to make up for this hardship. Villainage was not a purely unidirectional exploitative relationship. In the Middle Ages, land within a lord's manor provided sustenance and survival, and being a villain guaranteed access to land and crops secure from theft by marauding robbers. Landlords, even where legally entitled to do so, rarely evicted villains because of the value of their labor. Villainage was much preferable to being a vagabond, a slave, or an unlinded laborer. In many medieval countries, a villain could gain freedom by escaping from a manor to a city or borough and living there for more than a year. But this action involved a loss of land rights and agricultural livelihood, a prohibitive price unless the landlord was especially tyrannical or conditions in the village were unusually difficult. 
In medieval England, two types of villains existed villains regardant that were tied to land and villains and gross that could be traded separately from land. 23. Bordars and Cottagers in England, the Doomsday Book of 1086 uses Bordary Border and Katari Cotter as interchangeable terms. Cotter deriving from the native Anglo-Saxon tongue whereas Border derived from the French. 26. Punishment with an out. Whipping was a common punishment for Russian serfs. 27. Status-wise the border or cotter ranked below a serf in the social hierarchy of a manor holding a cottage, garden and just enough land to feed a family. In England, at the time of the Doomsday Survey, this would have comprised between about 1 and 5 acres, 0.4 and 2.0 hectares, 28 under an Elizabethan statute. The Erection of Cottages Act 1588 The cottage had to be built with at least 4 acres 0.02 square kilometers 0.01 square miles of land 29 The later Enclosures Acts 1604 onwards removed the cotter's right to any land. Before the Enclosures Act the cottager was a farm laborer with land and after the Enclosures Act the cottager was a farm laborer without land 30. The Bordars and Cotters did not own their draft oxen or horses. The Doomsday Book showed that England comprised 12% freeholders, 35% serfs or villains, 30% Cotters and Bordars, and 9% slaves, 28. Smurds Smurdy were a type of serfs above Kolops in medieval Poland and Kievan Rus. Kolops Kolops were the lowest class of serfs in the medieval and early modern Russia. They had status similar to slaves and could be freely traded. Slaves The last type of serf was the slave. 31. Slaves had the fewest rights and benefits from the manor. They owned no tenancy in land, worked for the lord exclusively and survived on donations from the landlord. It was always in the interest of the lord to prove that a servile arrangement existed as this provided him with a greater rights to fees and taxes. The status of a man was a primary issue in determining a person's rights and obligations in many of the manorial court cases of the period. Also, runaway slaves could be beaten if caught. Serfdom was significantly more common than slavery throughout the feudal period. The villain was the most common type of serf in the Middle Ages. Villains had more rights and status than those held as slaves but were under a number of legal restrictions that differentiated them from the freemen. Within his constraints, a serf had some freedom. Though the common wisdom is that a serf owned only his belly, even his clothes were the property in law of his lord, a serf might still accumulate personal property and wealth. The Americas in the Aztec Empire, the Tlaco class held similarities to serfdom. Even at its height, slaves only ever made up 2% of the population, 33. Gaelic Ireland In Gaelic Ireland, a political and social system existing in Ireland from the prehistoric period 500 BC or earlier up until the Norman Conquest 12th century AD. The Bothatch, Hut Dweller, Fuiter, perhaps linked to Fought Soil, 34, and St. Clay Old Dwelling House, 35, were low-ranked semi-free servile tenants similar to serfs 36, 37, according to Lawrence Janelle. The Senclai and Bothatch were not free to leave the territory except with permission, and in practice they usually served the Flaith Prince. They had no political or clan rights, could neither sue nor appear as witnesses, and were not free in the matter of entering into contracts. They could appear in a court of justice only in the name of the Flaith or other person to whom they belonged or whom they served or by obtaining from an heir of the two auth to which they belonged permission to sue in his name 38-39, a fluid or was. Defined by D.A. Binchy as a tenant at will, settled by the Lord Flaith on a portion of the latter's land. His services to the Lord are always undefined. Although his condition is servile, he retains the right to abandon his holding on giving to notice to the Lord and surrendering to him two-thirds of the products of his husbandry, 40-41. Paracoy the Paroikoi were the Byzantine equivalent of serfs, 42. Duties. Reven serfs in feudal England, c. 1310 the usual serf, not including slaves or cotters, paid his fees and taxes in the form of seasonally appropriate labor. Usually a portion of the week was devoted to plowing his lord's fields held into men, harvesting crops, digging ditches, repairing fences, and often working in the manor house. 
the remainder of the serf's time he spent tending his own fields, crops and animals in order to provide for his family. Most manorial work was segregated by gender during the regular times of the year. During the harvest, the whole family was expected to work the fields. A major difficulty of a serf's life was that his work for his lord coincided with and took precedence over the work he had to perform on his own lands. When the lord's crops were ready to be harvested, so were his own. On the other hand, the serf of a benign lord could look forward to being well-fed during his service. It was a lord without foresight who did not provide a substantial meal for his serfs during the harvest and planting times, citation needed in exchange for this work on the lord's domain. The serfs had certain privileges and rights, including for example the right to gather deadwood, an essential source of fuel, from their lord's forests. In addition to service, a serf was required to pay certain taxes and fees. Taxes were based on the assessed value of his lands and holdings. Fees were usually paid in the form of agricultural produce rather than cash. The best ration of wheat from the serf's harvest often went to the landlord. Generally hunting and trapping of wild game by the serfs on the lord's property was prohibited. On Easter Sunday the peasant family perhaps might owe an extra dozen eggs, and at Christmas a goose was perhaps required, too. When a family member died, extra taxes were paid to the lord as a form of feudal relief to enable the heir to keep the right due to what land he had. Any young woman who wished to marry a serf outside of her manor was forced to pay a fee for the right to leave her lord. And in compensation for her lost labor, often there were arbitrary tests to judge the worthiness of their tax payments. A chicken, for example might be required to be able to jump over a fence of a given height to be considered old enough or well enough to be valued for tax purposes. The restraints of serfdom on personal and economic choice were enforced through various forms of manorial customary law in the manorial administration and court baron. It was also a matter of discussion whether serfs could be required by law in times of war or conflict to fight for their lord's land and property. In the case of their lord's defeat, their own fate might be uncertain, so the serf certainly had an interest in supporting his lord. Rights within his constraints, a serf had some freedoms. Hey, Kyle. Though the common wisdom is that a serf owned only his belly, even his clothes were the property, in law, of his lord. A serf might still accumulate personal property and wealth, and some serfs become wealthier than their free neighbors. Although this happened rarely, 43, a well-to-do serf might even be able to buy his freedom, 44. A serf could grow what crop he saw fit on his lands, although a serf's taxes often had to be paid in wheat. The surplus he would sell at market. The landlord could not dispossess his serfs without legal cause and was supposed to protect them from the depredations of robbers or other lords. And he was expected to support them by charity in times of famine. Many such rights were enforceable by the serf in the manorial court, citation needed. Variations forms of serfdom varied greatly through time and regions. In some places, serfdom was merged with or exchanged for various forms of taxation. The amount of labor required varied. In Poland, for example, it was commonly a few days per year per household in the 13th century, one day per week per household in the 14th century four days per week per household in the 17th century, and six days per week per household in the 18th century. Early serfdom in Poland was mostly limited to the royal territories Kraluczyzny. Per household means that every dwelling had to give a worker for the required number of days 45, for example, in the 18th century, six people, a peasant, his wife. Three children and a hired worker might be required to work for their lord one day a week, which would be counted as six days of labor. Serfs served on occasion as soldiers in the event of conflict and could earn freedom or even ennoblement for valor in combat clarification needed, serfs could purchase their freedom. Be manumitted by generous owners or flee to towns or to newly settled land where few questions were asked. Laws varied from country to country. In England a serf who made his way to a chartered town, i.e. a borough, and evaded. Recapture for a year and a day obtained his freedom and became a burgher of the town. Emancipation dates by country Scotland. 
Naif's serfs disappeared by the late 14th century, 46, in the salt and coal mining industries a form of serfdom survived until the Colliers Scotland Act 1799, 47, 48 England and Wales. Obsolete by 15th 16th century, 47, Wallachia, August 5, 1746, 49, Land Reforms in 1864, Moldavia, August 6, 1749, 49, Land Reforms in 1864. 1848 Bohemia, the 1st of November 1781, first step, second step, 1848 Baden, the 23rd of July 1783, Denmark, the 20th of June 1788, part of Denmark, Norway, France, August 4th, the 4th of May 1798, Batavian Republic, Netherlands, Constitution of the 12th of June 1798, in theory, in practice, with the introduction of the French Code Napoleon in 1811, Serbia, 1804, de facto. The Jewry in 1830, Schleswig Holstein, the 19th of December 1804, part of Denmark, Norway, Swedish Pomerania, the 4th of July 1806, Duchy of Warsaw, Poland, the 22nd of July 1807, Prussia, October 1807, effectively 1820, Bavaria, the 31st of August 1808, Old Finland in 1812, as the area was incorporated into Grand Duchy of Finland where serfdom hadn't existed in centuries, if ever, Nassau. The 1st of September 1812, Spain, the 18th of March 1812, first step, second step, the 26th of August 1837, Argentina, 1813, Governorate of Estonia, the 23rd of March 1816, Governorate of Courland, the the 18th of November 1817, Governorate of Livonia, the 26th of March 1819, Hanover, 1831, Saxony, the 17th of March 1832, Hungary, the 11th of April 1848, Croatia. First steps in 1780 and 1785, 50 final step on the 8th of May 1848, Austrian Empire, the 7th of September 1848, 51, Bulgaria, 1858, the Jewry by Ottoman Empire, de facto in 8. The 19th of February 1861, Sea Emancipation Reform of 1861, Tonga, 1862, Hawaii, 1835. The proclamation by Count Josip Jelasic abolishing serfdom in the Kingdom of Croatia, dated the 25th of April 1848 Congress Poland, 1864-52, Georgia, 1864-1871 Kalmykia, 1923 Bhutan, officially abolished by 1959-11, Tibet People's Republic of China, the 29th of March 1959, but use of serf for Tibet is controversial. There are differences depending on the region and sect. 7, 8, 9, 10. See also Lippenberg Girls Colonis, Early Medieval Serfs, Kuli Kotarenko Mienda, Spanish Serfdom Transplanted to the Americas, Feudalism, Fiefdom, Foal, Work Freeholder, Fugitive. Peasants Hacienda, Spanish Manor Selet, Ancient Greek Serfs and Entered Servant Josephinism Kolob Kol Kos Manor, Welsh Manors Manorialism Ministerialist Peonage Russian Serfdom Serfdom Pant Serfdom in Tibet Controversy Serfs Emancipation Daysher Cropping Show in Japanese Serfdom Slavery Smurd Tiog, Welsh Serfs Thrall Yeoman, English Freeholders Ritzerio Function Indentured servitude connected to indenture America's debt from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. An indenture signed by Henry Mayer, with an X, in 1738. This contract bound Mayor to Abraham Heston of Bucks County, Pennsylvania, who had paid for Mayer to travel from Europe. Indentured servitude is a form of labor in which a person is contracted to work without salary for a specific number of years. The contract, called an indenture, may be entered voluntarily for eventual compensation or debt repayment or it may be imposed as a judicial punishment. Historically, it has been used to pay for apprenticeships. Typically when an apprentice agreed to work for free for a master tradesman to learn a trade similar to a modern internship but for a fixed length of time. Usually seven years or less. Later it was also used as a way for a person to pay the cost of transportation to colonies in the Americas. Like any loan, an indenture could be sold. Most employers had to depend on middlemen to recruit and transport the workers. 
so indentures indentured workers were commonly bought and sold when they arrived at their destinations. Like prices of slaves, their price went up or down depending on supply and demand. When the indenture loan was paid off, the worker was free. Sometimes they might be given a plot of land. Indentured workers could usually marry, move about locally as long as the work got done, read whatever they wanted, and take classes. The America's main article, Indentured Servitude in British America. North America until the late 18th century, indentured servitude was common in British America. It was often a way for Europeans to migrate to the American colonies, they signed an indenture in return for a costly passage. However, the system was also used to exploit Asians, mostly from India and China, who wanted to migrate to the New World. These Asian people were used mainly to construct roads and railway systems. After their indenture expired, the immigrants were free to work for themselves or another employer. At least one economist has suggested that indentured servitude occurred largely as an institutional response to a capital market imperfection. One, in some cases, the indenture was made with a ship's master who sold the indenture to an employer in the colonies. Most indentured servants worked as farm laborers or domestic servants, although some were apprenticed to craftsmen. The terms of an indenture were not always enforced by American courts, although runaways were usually sought out and returned to their employer. Between one half and two thirds of European immigrants to the American colonies between the 1630s and American Revolution came under indentures too, however. While almost half the European immigrants to the 13 colonies were indentured servants at any one time they were outnumbered by workers who had never been indentured or whose indenture had expired. And thus free wage labor was the more prevalent for Europeans in the colonies. Three indentured people were numerically important mostly in the region from Virginia north to New Jersey. Other colonies saw far fewer of them. The total number of European immigrants to all 13 colonies before 1775 was about 500,000, of these 55,000 were involuntary prisoners. Of the 450,000 or so European arrivals who came voluntarily, Tomlins estimates that 48% were indentured, or about 75% of these were under the age of 25. The age of adulthood for men was 24 years, not 21. Those over 24 generally came on contracts lasting about three years, five regarding the children who came. Gary Nash reports that many of the servants were actually nephews, nieces, cousins and children of friends of emigrating Englishmen who paid their passage in return for their labor once in America. Six. Several instances of kidnapping, seven, for transportation to the Americas are recorded, such as that of Peter Williamson, 1730 to 1799. As historian Richard Hofstadter pointed out, although efforts were made to regulate or check their activities, and they diminished in importance in the 18th century. It remains true that a certain small part of the European colonial population of America was brought by force and a much larger portion came in response to deceit and misrepresentation on the part of the spirits recruiting agents. 8-1 spirit named William Thien was known to have spirited away. 9-840 people from Britain to the colonies in a single year. 10 historian Lerone Bennett Jr. notes that masters given to flogging often did not care whether their victims were black or white. 11 also, during the 18th and early 19th centuries, children from the UK were often kidnapped and sold into indentured labor in the American and Caribbean colonies, often without any indentures. 12-13 Indentured servitude was also used by governments in Britain as a punishment for captured prisoners of war in rebellions and civil wars. Oliver Cromwell sent into indentured service thousands of prisoners captured in the 1648 Battle of Preston and the 1651 Battle of Worcester. King James II acted similarly after the Monmouth Rebellion in 1685, and use of such measures continued into the 18th century, citation needed. Indentured servants could not marry without the permission of their master, were sometimes subject to physical punishment and did not receive legal favor from the courts. Female indentured servants in particular might be raped and or sexually abused by their masters. 
If children were produced the labor would be extended by two years. 14 cases of successful prosecution for these crimes were very uncommon. As indentured servants were unlikely to have access to a magistrate and social pressure to avoid such brutality could vary by geography and cultural norm. The situation was particularly difficult for indentured women because in both low social class and gender citation needed they were believed to be particularly prone to vice making legal redress unusual. The American Revolution severely limited immigration to the United States but economic historians dispute its long-term impact. Sharon Salinger argues that the economic crisis that followed the war made long-term labor contracts unattractive. His analysis of Philadelphia's population shows how the percentage of bound citizens fell from 17% to 6.4% over the course of the war. 15. William Miller posits a more moderate theory, stating that the revolution wrought disturbances upon white servitude. But these were temporary rather than lasting. 16. David Galenson supports this theory by proposing that the numbers of British indentured servants never recovered and that Europeans from other nationalities replaced them. 17. Indentured servitude began its decline after Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion was a servant uprising against the government of Colonial Virginia, 18. This was due to multiple factors, such as the treatment of servants, supports of native tribes in the surrounding area. A refusal to expand the amount of land an indentured servant could work by the colonial government. And an equality between the upper and lower class in colonial society, 18. Indentured servitude was the primary source of labor for early American colonists up until the rebellion, 19 little changed in the immediate aftermath of Bacon's rebellion. However, the rebellion did cause a general distrust of servant labor and fear of future rebellion, 20, the fear of indentured servitude would eventually cement itself into the hearts of Americans leading towards the reliance on enslaved Africans. 21. This helped to ingrain the idea of racial segregation and unite white Americans under race rather than Economic or social class 20, doing so would prevent the potential for future rebellion and change the way that agriculture was approached in the future. The American and British governments passed several laws that helped foster the decline of indentures. The UK Parliament's Passenger Vessels Act 1803 regulated travel conditions aboard ships to make transportation more expensive so as to hinder landlords' tenants seeking a better life. An American law passed in 1833 abolished the imprisonment of debtors, which made prosecuting runaway servants more difficult, increasing the risk of indenture contract purchases. The 13th Amendment, passed in the wake of the American Civil War, made indentured servitude illegal in the United States. Contracts through its introduction. The details regarding indentured labor varied across import and export regions and most overseas contracts were made before the voyage with the understanding that Prospective migrants were competent enough to make overseas contracts on their own account and that they preferred to have a contract before the voyage. 22. Most labor contracts made were in increments of five years, with the opportunity to extend another five years. Many contracts also provided free passage home after the dictated labor was completed. However, there were generally no policies regulating employers once the labor hours were completed, which led to frequent ill-treatment. 22. Caribbean Indian woman in traditional dress in 1643, the European population of Barbados was 37,223, 86% of the population, 24, during the wars of the three kingdoms. At least 10,000 Scottish and Irish prisoners of war were transported as indentured laborers to the colonies. 25. A half million Europeans went as indentured servants to the Caribbean, primarily the English-speaking islands of the Caribbean, before 1840-26-27. In 1838, with the abolition of slavery at its onset, the British were in the process of transporting a million Indians out of India and into the Caribbean to take the place of the recently freed Africans freed in 1833 in indenture ship. Women, looking for what they believed would be a better life in the colonies, were specifically sought after and recruited at a much higher rate than men due to the high population of men already in the colonies citation needed, however. 
Women had to prove their status as single and eligible to emigrate, as married women could not leave without their husbands. Many women seeking escape from abusive relationships were willing to take that chance. The Indian Immigration Act of 1883-28 prevented women from exiting India as widowed or single in order to escape. 29. Arrival in the colonies brought unexpected conditions of poverty, homelessness and little to no food as the high numbers of emigrants overwhelmed the small villages and flooded the labor market. Many were forced into signing labor contracts that exposed them to the hard field labor on the plantation. Additionally, on arrival to the plantation, single women were assigned a man as they were not allowed to live alone. The subtle difference between slavery and indentureship is best seen here as women were still subjected to the control of the plantation owners as well as their newly assigned partner 30. Colonial Indian Indenture System The Indian Indenture System was a system of indenture, a form of debt bondage, by which 2,031,000 Indians called coolies were transported to various colonies of European powers to provide labor for the mainly sugar plantations. It started from the end of slavery in 1833 and continued until 1920. This resulted in the development of a large Indian diaspora, which spread from the Indian Ocean, i.e. Reunion and Mauritius, to Pacific Ocean, i.e. Fiji, as well as the growth of Indo-Caribbean and Indo-African population. The British wanted local black Africans to work in natal as workers. But the locals refused and as a result, the British introduced the Indian indenture system, resulting in a permanent Indian South African presence. On the 18th of January 1826, the government of the French Indian Ocean Island of Réunion laid down terms for the introduction of Indian laborers to the colony. Each man was required to appear before a magistrate and declare that he was going voluntarily. The contract was for five years with pay of 8 rupees 12 cents US citation needed per month and rations provided laborers had been transported from Pondicherry and Karaikal. The first attempt at importing Indian labor into Mauritius in 1829 ended in failure, but by 1834, with the abolition of slavery throughout most of the British Empire, transportation of Indian labor to the island gained pace. By 1838, 25,000 Indian laborers had been transported to Mauritius. After the end of slavery, the West Indian sugar colonies tried the use of emancipated slaves, families from Ireland, Germany and Malta and Portuguese from Madeira. All these efforts failed to satisfy the labor needs of the colonies due to high mortality of the new arrivals and their reluctance to continue working at the end of their indenture. On the 16th of November 1844, the British Indian government legalized emigration to Jamaica, Trinidad and Demerara, Guyana. The first ship, Whitbeat, sailed from Calcutta for British Guiana on the 13th of January 1838 and arrived in Berbice on the 5th of May 1838. Transportation to the Caribbean stopped in 1848 due to problems in the sugar industry and resumed in Demerara and Trinidad in 1851 and Jamaica in 1860. This system of labor was coined by contemporaries at the time as new system of slavery a term later used by historian Hugh Tinker in his largely influential book of the same name, 32. The Indian indenture system was finally banned in 1917, 33, according to The Economist. When the Indian Legislative Council finally ended indenture, it did so because of pressure from Indian nationalists and declining profitability, rather than from humanitarian concerns, 33. Oceania main article, Blackbirding. Convicts transported to the Australian colonies before the 1840s often found themselves hired out in a form of indentured labor. 34. Indentured servants also emigrated to New South Wales. 35. The Van Demons Land Company used skilled indentured labor for periods of seven years or less. 36. A similar scheme for the Swan River area of Western Australia existed between 1829 and 1832. 37. During the 1860s planters in Australia, Fiji, New Caledonia and the Samoa Islands, in need of laborers, encouraged a trade in long-term indentured labor called blackbirding. 
At the height of the labor trade, more than one half the adult male population of several of the islands worked abroad. Citation needed. Over a period of 40 years, from the mid-19th century to the early 20th century, labor for the sugar cane fields of Queensland. Australia included an element of coercive recruitment and indentured servitude of the 62,000 South Sea Islanders. The workers came mainly from Melanesia, mainly from the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, with a small number from Polynesian and Micronesian areas such as Samoa. The Gilbert Islands, subsequently known as Kiribati, and the Ellis Islands, subsequently known as Tuvalu. They became collectively known as Kanakas, citation needed. It remains unknown how many islanders the trade controversially kidnapped. Whether the system legally recruited islanders, persuaded, deceived, coerced or forced them to leave their homes and travel by ship to Queensland remains difficult to determine. Official documents and accounts from the period often conflict with the oral tradition passed down to the descendants of workers. Stories of blatantly violent kidnapping tend to relate to the first 10 to 15 years of the trade, citation needed. Australia deported many of these islanders back to their places of origin in the period 1906 to 1908 under the provisions of the Pacific Island Labourers Act 1901-38. Australia's own colonies of Papua and New Guinea, joined after the Second World War to form Papua New Guinea, were the last jurisdictions in the world to use indentured servitude, citation needed. Africa A significant number of construction projects in British East Africa and South Africa required vast quantities of labor exceeding the availability or willingness of local tribesmen. Indentured coolies from India were imported for such projects as the Uganda Railway, as farm labor and as miners. They and their descendants formed a significant portion of the population and economy of Kenya and Uganda, although not without engendering resentment from others. Idi Amin's expulsion of the Asians from Uganda in 1972 was an expulsion of Indo-Africans, 39. The majority of the population of Mauritius are descendants of Indian indentured labourers brought in between 1834 and 1921. Initially brought to work the sugar estates following the abolition of slavery in the British Empire an estimated half a million indentured labourers were present on the island during this period. A.A. Pravasi got in the bay at Port Louis and now a UNESCO site was the first British colony to serve as a major reception centre for indentured servants from India who came to work on plantations following the abolition of slavery, 40. Legal Status The Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948 declares in Article 4, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms, 41, more specifically. It is dealt with by Article 1 of the United Nations 1956 Supplementary Convention on the Abolition of Slavery. However, only national legislation can establish the unlawfulness of indentured labor in a specific jurisdiction. In the United States, the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act VTVPA of 2000 extended servitude to cover peonage as well as involuntary servitude 42.